This is going to be 1 Corinthians chapter number 3, verse by verse. I wanted to go through the chapter and look at the subject of how to look like a failure at the judgment seat of Christ. Now, and understand me when I say this, uh, if you're born again, then when it comes to your salvation, the Lord never looks at you as a failure. You're never seen as anything less than perfect. But when it comes to our walk, we don't want to get to the judgment seat of Christ having walked for the flesh, or the world, and the devil. We want to be, when we get to the judgment seat of Christ, to have lived for the Lord. We don't want to get up there and, you know, be ashamed because of the lack of Christian service that we had down here. But if you want to look like a failure at the judgment seat of Christ, then here's some things that will make you look like one. 1 Corinthians 3 and verse 1 says, And I, brethren, could not speak unto you as unto spiritual, but as unto carnal, even as unto babes in Christ. So number one, if you want to blow it and just be ashamed at the judgment seat of Christ, stay a baby Christian all your spiritual life. Did you notice how men in this world never seem to grow up anymore today? They just like they stay little kids forever. That is also how it is spiritually. Christians are staying little babies. They can't feed themselves the Word of God. They can't walk, at least not in the Spirit. They are very limited in what they can say. They have no idea what justification is or imputation or propitiation or sanctification or glorification. They don't know anything about the rapture, the tribulation. They don't know really anything about the Bible. And Paul wants to talk to them like they are spiritual, but he can't because they are carnal. That is, worldly, fleshly. And the reason they don't grow is because they aren't fed the words of God. 1 Corinthians 3, 2 says, I have fed you with milk and not with meat. For hitherto you were not able to bear it, neither yet now are ye able. So Paul's trying to feed them, but they can't take it. Uh, 1 Peter 2 and verse 2 says, As newborn babes desire the sincere milk of the word that you may grow thereby. The milk of the word will help you grow as a Christian. Uh, 2 Peter 3.18 says, But grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. So you can't grow in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ without reading about Him, without spending time with Him. There should never be a time where you aren't consistently reading the Bible, not just picking, picking it up once a month. I mean, every day you should be reading the Bible. You say, well, I already know everything there is to know about Jesus Christ because I've been to church my whole life and my parents read me Bible stories and things like that. You say you've read the Gospels and maybe you read through the whole Bible once and you say, I already know everything there is to know about Jesus Christ, but you're wrong. Ephesians 3, 8 says unto me, who am less than the least of all saints, is this grace given that I should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ. His ways are past finding out. You could search Google, eSword, Sword Searcher, and every commentary and still not know all there is to know about the Lord Jesus Christ. So if you're a babe in Christ, you need to read the book and study so you can one day be a full age spiritually. You can get a hold of some strong meat one day if you just keep reading. Uh, get you a Bible reading plan. In 30 minutes, you can easily read 5 to 10 chapters a day. Get a new Bible topic each week to study. Study through an entire chapter each week. Do this and you'll be more spiritually fed than 90% of the Christians you meet and you'll be feeding it to yourself. You won't be a baby anymore. Do you want to know how to look bad at the judgment? Never read your Bible. And also, be a troublemaking, big mouth, jealous, busybody. And this describes much of the body of Christ. In 1 Corinthians 3, 3, it says, For ye are yet carnal, for whereas there is among you envying and strife and divisions. Are you not carnal and walk as men? Someone isn't just carnal for drinking. They are carnal for envy and strife. They walk as men. They neglect walking in the Spirit. Uh, James 3, 16 says, For where envying and strife is, there is confusion in every evil work. Those are some bad sins right there. 
1 Corinthians 1.10, And I beseech you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that ye all speak the same thing, and that there be no divisions among you, but that ye be perfectly joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment. So all the envying and strife and divisions, it's all worldly. It's all going to keep you from serving God and turning out like you should when it comes to your Christian service at the judgment seat of Christ. 1 Corinthians 3, 4 says, For while one saith, I am of Paul, and another, I am of Apollos, are you not carnal? So these Corinthians were arguing back and forth, and some of them studied after Apollos, some after Paul. Then they split over minor disagreements, dividing over minor things is carnal and stupid. And the devil loves to divide and conquer. He would love to have this Bible believer who lives in the same city as this other Bible believer, he would love to have them just split and go to separate ends of the city. And But there's nothing wrong with following a man who is following the Lord. In 1 Corinthians 11, 1, it says, Be ye followers of me, even as I also am of Christ. 1 Corinthians 3, 5, Who then is Paul, and who is Apollos, but ministers by whom ye believed, even as the Lord gave to every man. So Paul is like, who is Paul? Who is Apollos? That's what they're, he said they're saying. Pretty much saying, who cares about us? We are a bunch of nobodies. They're going around saying, who's for Paul? Who's for Apollos? And Paul's like, who is Paul? Who is Apollos? We're nobodies especially sitting next to the Lord Jesus Christ. Why put a man over Jesus Christ? Anything man can do, God can do and do way better. The things God can do, man can't do. Uh, 1 Corinthians 3, 6 says, I have planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the increase. So Paul preached the gospel. Apollos preached the gospel. Paul won some men, Apollos won certain men to the Lord. But at the end of the day, it is God that gave the increase. They both planted seeds, but God did the saving. At best, your favorite teacher is a seed planter. He wasn't crucified for you. So to split and envy and strife over who someone's Bible teacher is, is carnal. 1 Corinthians 3, 7. So then neither is he that planteth anything... Neither he that watereth, but God that giveth the increase. Galatians 6, 3, For if a man think himself to be something, when he's nothing, he deceiveth himself. The moment you find out that you are nothing, that you aren't anything, that will be one of the greatest moments in your Christian life. Quit trying to be more than a nothing. You're spending too much time trying to be something big in the eyes of men instead of trying to make Jesus Christ and his book look big in the eyes of men. You want to know how to look like a flop at the judgment seat of Christ in terms of your Christian service. Remember, I'm not talking about your standing, how you stand perfect in the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm talking about, do you want to look like a flop when it comes to your Christian walk, your Christian service at the judgment seat of Christ? Then do great things and do wonderful things and do incredible things but do them with the wrong motive and let those works puff you up. That's how you end up a flop at the judgment seat of Christ. 1 Corinthians 3, eight says, Now he that planteth and he that watereth are one, and every one shall receive his own reward according to his own labor. So it's not necessarily how many you win to the Lord. It's about planting seeds. It is about preaching the gospel to every creature. For example, my pastor has witnessed to the same man for 25 years in the man's same trailer. He still hasn't gotten him saved yet. And let's say tomorrow another Christian knocks on the man's door and the man finally believes the gospel after this man witnesses to him. But who did the most labor for the lost man? Obviously my pastor who knocked on his door for 25 years, not the man who just happened to show up and give him the gospel and get him saved that day and Paul says every man shall receive his own reward according to his own labor so who would get more of a reward here my pastor who labored with the man for 25 years or the man who just came up to the door 
and gave him the gospel that day and he gets saved. I mean, that's that's, a, that's tough. I mean, he won the soul, but my pastor put in 25 years of labor. Seems like the one that put in the 25 years of labor would get the more of a reward or just as good, if not better. And now 1 Corinthians 3, 9 says, For we are laborers together with God. Ye are God's husbandry. Ye are God's building. So we are God's husbandry. We are like farmers laboring for God, helping with the sheep. And the Lord told Peter if he loves him to feed his sheep. And Paul says a lot about working. In Ephesians 4, 28, it says, Let him that stole steal no more, but rather let him labor, working with his hands the thing which is good that he may have to give to him that needeth. Titus 3, 8, this is a faithful saying, and those things I will that thou affirm constantly, that they which have believed in God might be careful to maintain good works. These things are good and profitable unto men. So you need to do works. You need to do works for God. You need to get up and go to work. And that's also a good work for God. Did you know that working with your own hands every day, getting up, and going to a full-time job, that's also working for God. Because no Christian should be seen as a lazy loser sitting at home doing absolutely nothing if they're able. And we are also God's building in Ephesians 2, 19 through 22. It says, Now therefore ye are no more strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and of the household of God, and are built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself, being the chief cornerstone, in whom all the building fitly framed together groweth unto an holy temple in the Lord, in whom ye also are builded together for an habitation of God through the Spirit. Now 1 Corinthians 3.10, According to the grace of God, which is given unto me as a wise master builder, I have laid the foundation, and another buildeth thereon. But let every man take heed how he buildeth thereon. So when you lead someone to the Lord Jesus Christ, you are adding stones to the building. And we're called stones in the Bible. Uh, 1 Peter 2, 5 says, Ye also as lively stones are built up a spiritual house and holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God by Jesus Christ. Now 1 Corinthians 3, 11, For other foundation can no man lay than that is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is the foundation. And we built our house on the rock. We have a good foundation. Now we need to be careful with what we build with. Because of that verse said, According to the grace of God, which is given unto me as a wise master builder, I have laid the foundation, and another buildeth thereon, but let every man take heed how he buildeth thereon. So we got Jesus Christ as a foundation, and we're going to build on this rock. Through our saved life, we're building on something. And if we want to make it good at the judgment seat of Christ, we're going to have to be careful with what we build with. And now look at verse 12. It says, Now if any man build upon this foundation gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, stubble, every man's work shall be made manifest, for the day shall declare it, because it shall be revealed by fire, and the fire shall try every man's work of what sort it is. So after the rapture, we are going to the judgment seat of Christ. The Lord is going to put our works that we have done for him in the fire, and if it makes it out of the fire then we get rewards for it. But if we built with wood and hay and stubble, if we built that, then we won't get rewards because that stuff won't make it through the fire. You can do work for the Lord with the wrong motive. And the work you've done that was for self or for just to look good, that's not a good motive. But the Lord is going to try every man's work of what sort it is. In verse 14 it says, If any man's work abide which he hath built thereon, he shall receive a reward. If any man's work shall be burned, he shall suffer loss. But he himself shall be saved, yet so as by fire. So you see there he doesn't lose his salvation. The judgment seat of Christ itself shows that a man doesn't lose his salvation because if, he, if a person's getting to the judgment seat of Christ and all they have is wood, hay, and stubble, then they didn't live a very good Christian life. And that also shows that not every Christian is going to act like a Christian throughout their saved life because if every Christian automatically just became a great person, 
when they got saved, then everybody would be getting a lot of rewards at the judgment seat of Christ. There are Christians who act just like the world, and they they pretty much continue to serve the devil even after they get saved. And these are the people that are going to look like a flop at the judgment seat of Christ. And then 1 Peter 3.20, it says, Which sometime were disobedient, when once the long suffering of God waited in the days of Noah, while well, the ark was a preparing, wherein few, that is, eight souls, were saved by water. You see that there? Noah was saved by water, and that the water never touched him. The water never touched Noah in the flood. So in 1 Corinthians 3 and verse 15, when it says, But he himself shall be saved, yet so as by fire. He's saved by fire in verse 15, in the sense the fire doesn't touch him. You're not burned. It's the works that are burned. And if you look at verse 15, it said, If any man's work shall be burned. It's not him getting burned. He's not getting punished by getting burned. It's not the Christian who is burned up. It's his works that weren't any good. Now, how else are you going to blow it before you get to the judgment seat? You can forget that your body is the temple of God. And if you do this, you're going to be reaping what you sow in the flesh. You can die early. And then when you get to the judgment seat, you're not going to have anything. In the Old Testament, God had a temple for his people. But now he has his people for a temple. Your body is the temple. In verse 16 it says, Know you not that ye are the temple of God, and that the Spirit of God dwelleth in you. So God is omnipresent. He's everywhere at once. Right now he can see every person who is being raped. He can see every person who is murdering someone. He witnessed every murder by Ted Bundy and John Wayne Gacy and Ed Gein and all these serial killers. His eyes are in every place, beholding the evil and the good. He sees the darkest, deepest secrets in the government. But in a sense, since the Holy Ghost dwells in you, you take God with you everywhere you go. He's already there in the sense of his omnipresence, but in the sense that he dwells in the born-again Christian, you take him everywhere you go. And I love being around my family. I don't like to leave my wife or my daughter for any period of time. Sometimes I wish they could just come to work with me. But if you think about it, you, you have something that is even more special than your family that goes with you everywhere you go, and that is Christ in you, the hope of glory. As it says in Colossians 1.27, To whom God would make known what is the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. So your body is where the Lord dwells. It is his temple. Your body is no longer yours, so quit acting like it's yours. In 1 Corinthians six nineteen through 20, it says, What? Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost which is in you, which ye have of God, and ye are not your own, for ye are bought with the price? Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. So the moment you believe the gospel, God moved in, and you can't evict him. He bought you. You're a purchased possession. You were purchased with his own blood. That's God's blood. And if you want to look good at the judgment seat, then don't forget that your body is the Lord's. If you are conscious, conscious every day that you're living in a body that is the temple of the Holy Ghost, you're going to live better than someone who is not acknowledging that fact. Would you still be playing those same video games if the Lord walked in your bedroom or living room? Would you still be watching those dirty movies if the Lord walked in? No, you wouldn't. But the thing is, he he's already walked in. He's already right there with you at all times. In 1 Corinthians, that is if you're saved. In 1 Corinthians 3.17, it says, If any man defile the temple of God, him shall God destroy. For the temple of God is holy, which temple you are. Ye are. A lost per Every lost person is in the presence of God. God is everywhere. He sees everything. But a saved person... It goes a step further. You have Christ in you. We are eternally secure in that after we get saved, we can never lose our salvation. But you can lose everything else if you don't live right. If a Christian lives wicked, then he will be destroyed. Notice it says, If any man defile the temple of God, him shall God destroy. If a Christian lives wicked, then 
he will be destroyed. This is a scary verse, and baby Christians don't understand this. You can't live however you want to live and get by. Paul is having to say this to carnal Corinthians in this carnal Corinthian church. In Romans 8, 13, Paul says, For if you live after the flesh, ye shall die. But if you through the Spirit do mortify the deeds of the body, you shall live. So the devil can never possess your soul if you're saved. But he can get a hold of your flesh and you'll feel pain. The devil is the rod of God. He uses the God uses the devil as a paddle to chasten his children. Hebrews twelve eight says, But if ye be without chastisement, whereof all are partakers, then are ye bastards and not sons. And Paul even talks about in 1 Corinthians 5, 5, to deliver such an one into Satan for destruction of the flesh that the spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. So the devil can't get your soul, but he can get in possession of your flesh and destroy your flesh. So in a sense, a Christian can't be demon-possessed or devil-possessed, but in a sense, he can be devil-possessed. The devil can get everything except your soul. He can't take your salvation, but he can get your flesh and destroy it, just like the man in 1 Corinthians 5 and verse 5. Now, 1 Corinthians three eighteen through 19 says, Let no man deceive himself. If any man among you seemeth to be wise in this world, let him become a fool that he may be wise. For the wisdom of this world is foolishness with God. For it is written, He taketh the wise in their own craftiness. So what is the wisdom of this present evil world, as Paul calls it? The wisdom of the world says, A woman can kill her unborn baby, and that should be her choice. That's the world's wisdom. But the Bible calls them murderers. The wisdom of this world says that man is basically good. But the Bible says man at his best state is altogether vanity. The Bible says, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. The Bible says, For there is none righteous, no, not one. The Bible says, There is not a just man upon the earth who doeth good and sinneth not. Uh, the world says hell is a party. The Bible says hell is punishment. The Bible said there shall be weeping, wailing, and gnashing of teeth. The Bible said that the rich man was in hell and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus, that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am tormented in this flame. The wisdom of this world can make it seem smart and good and wise to do something that's really stupid. Uh, the wisdom of this world teaches that it's okay for a grown man to dress up like a woman and read stories to children in the public libraries. That's that drag queen story hour stuff, if you haven't heard of that. You really need to look that up because there are wicked, perverted men dressing up like sissy women and going to libraries and reading stories to little kids. You know, across the country, that's a big thing now. But the wisdom of this world says that's okay. The wisdom of this world says it's okay for uh, a, a whore to walk on the street and for fornication and it's okay for uh, these same sex perverts to dance in front of those kids in those public libraries which they're also doing but the bible says that's an abomination and common sense tells you that's an abomination for something like that to go on the bible says and jesus said himself in matthew eighteen six, but who shall Whoso shall offend one of these little ones which believe in me, it were better for him that a millstone were hanged about his neck and that he were drowned in the depth of the sea. So all these perverts that want to mess with little kids all the time, the Lord himself said it were better for a millstone to be hanged around their neck and them drown in the depths of the sea. But the filthy perverted man would love to do whatever he wants with the kids that he's reading those stories to at these drag queen story hours. And it's already happened. Uh, you, you say, well, you, you just have to love these trannies. That's not love because true love hates. If you love innocent children, then you're going to hate pedophiles. Uh, love the pedophile in the sense that you want to give him the gospel, but that's it. Have no sympathy for a perverted tranny or child rapist or sodomite.
no sympathy. Don't grow soft on those sins. It doesn't matter if it's your family member. You know, it could happen to any of us. Uh, your kid could walk in tomorrow and say, well, hey, I'm I'm a bisexual or a lesbian or whatever, but you can't grow soft on sin just because your kid is committing that certain sin. 1 Corinthians 3.20 says, And again the Lord knoweth the thoughts of the wise, that they are vain. So the Lord knows the thoughts of the wise men of this world. They are foolish and vain compared to God's wisdom. Their wisdom only goes as far as this world goes. They don't have their affection on things above. 1 Corinthians 3.21 says, Therefore let no man glory in men, and for all things are yours. What is the sense of glorying in man? God is better. In a race, who gets the glory? The one who won the race. Uh, no one can outrun God, so why would man get glory over God? Paul says, for all things are yours. You're in Christ and everything is Christ. And he's going to let you reign with him in the kingdom. Uh, 1 Corinthians 3.22 says, whether Paul or Apollos or Cephas or the world or death or life or death or things present or things to come, all are yours. So Paul... Apollos and Cephas are said to be theirs because they're their ministers. Pastors, teachers, and evangelists are actually gifts given by God to the body of Christ as it talks about in Ephesians chapter 4. And 1 Corinthians 3.22 says, Whether Paul or Apollos or Cephas or the world or life or death or things present or things to come, all are yours. So the world is ours. We'll reign on it with him one day. Life is ours. It was given to us as a free gift, as it calls it in Romans 6.23. And then 1 Corinthians 3.23 says, And ye are Christ's, and Christ is God's. If you're born again, then you are the Lord's. You are a purchased possession. You've been, you've been purchased by his own blood. But this has been 1 Corinthians chapter 3 on how to look like a failure at the judgment seat of Christ. So if you want to do good when you get to that judgment seat and get rewards and crowns and a millennial inheritance, then do what you can. Do the best things you can for the Lord. And do it for the Lord. Don't do it for yourself. Don't do it for anybody else. But get working and have some good Christian service to show the Lord when you get there.